for me, it brings me on to, to something that I'm extremely excited and passionate about. And really, you know, the, the conversations that Dolph and Henny have had in the past have been there for the elite few. Now, I'm not sure if you know the story of Henry Ford, but before Henry Ford came along, cars were only for the elite few. You would go in, they were very expensive, they were very bespoke. What that means is that I would choose whether I wanted a red steering wheel, leather seats, and what my exterior would look like. Henry Ford came along and he said, listen, the bottom line is you can have any car you want, it can be any color you want, as long as it's the Model T Ford and it's black. And he brought the price all the way down. And what his dream was, was to provide transportation to the middle class. In the process of doing that, he revolutionized an entire industry. For most of you who don't know this, I think I learned this from you, Dolph, I'm not 100% sure. But um, for most of you who don't know this, in, uh, in 1910, around that time, what were the top, there were five companies in America that were the wealthiest, and four of them came from one industry. What were they? Oil. Pardon? Steel. Oil, steel. Railways. railways. It was the railways. And interesting enough, they had 80% of the market share uh, at the time. Today, you know, and, and Henry Ford was one of the major people behind it, he, he created trucks. And now trucks have 80%. And what's interesting with that analogy is that sometimes the biggest players in the market don't even, even see the revolution that is coming. And that's what excites me. Because just like the Arab Spring, whether people like it or not, once people realize the value to them, it's going to happen with or without compliance, with or without technology. Does that make sense? So I wanted to share with you uh, just a couple of things. The 20th century was all about literally people competing, winning at all costs, making money up front, our interests not being aligned, trying to sell you things, run to the back of the room and buy something now or get something if you uh, coaching or books or CDs, hidden fees, lack of trust, lack of transparency, unsustainable based on nature, and lastly, greed. A lot of the problems we've experienced in the last five years, particularly in the syndication and real estate market, is because of those 10 things. Most importantly, the hidden fees. If you knew you were investing 100 Rand and they were taking 26 Rand off the front end, that's technically bankrupt from day one. What about the 21st century? It's being based on nature's laws, mutual gain. Our interests are aligned. We earn on the back end. You only earn more after people have performed. It's about partnership. You have a complete financial understanding. The income was 100, the expenses were 50, I made 50, and how did it get distributed? Not 35 pages of financials that you need to have an MBA from Harvard to try and understand. Trust, transparency, and most importantly, social collaboration. I, interestingly enough, did my dissertation in 1998 at UCT on how IT was going to change computers and property. And I said then, my synopsis was an old industry steeped in tradition, run by many smaller, disparate, and often inefficient operators, redefine it through the use of web technology, increase global reach, partnerships, and efficiency of scale, and basically provide a one-stop enhanced and personalized service to our clients. Now you've got to admit, in 2014, that's fairly obvious, but in 1998, at the age of 20, that was a fairly ahead of the times. And I'm pretty chuffed and pretty proud that uh, it's taken us the best part of 16 years to get to the destination and get to the goal. You know, Wealth Migrate was formed in the crisis in, uh, in 2008. And the concept was formed because there was an awesome building in London. A whole lot of South Africans had made a bad mistake. We could pick this building up for about less than 50% of what they bought it for more than three months before. The challenge is the building was fully built, fully tenanted, we just needed a cool, calm, collected 10 million pounds quickly. I tried to put my credit card through, but it wasn't accepted. So what we decided was we need to go out and find other like-minded people to make sure we could take advantage. Henry and myself met each other in 2009, and we embarked on a journey. We created the company in 2010, and the whole philosophy behind the company was the laws of nature. I mean, when you look at it, when you have birds flying in a flock, 25 birds flying in a flock can fly 70% further than one bird flying on its own. This bird at the front is taking all the strain, and these two on the outside are also taking the strain. But they don't do that. They swap all the time so they can go a lot further. 
in Anglo-Saxon business and what we've been used to in the 20th century is that that guy is trying to make all the money and he's trying to screw all those guys to the right and sue all those people to the left. Michael Drew, I'd highly recommend a book called Pendulum. He talks a lot. We had the privilege of meeting this guy in October last year. He talks about the 40-year cycles and how you have to be ahead of the trend and basically how people are going forward now in terms of the 40-year cycle. And I've spoken about Henry Ford and the impact and what we want to do in terms of bringing it together and creating wealth and, and unlocking both residential, commercial, development and international property to everybody. Our aim is to revolutionize and improve the property industry like Google did for the internet and to create massive wealth for all by 2015. We've got a fairly complicated mission and I'm not going to go into it. It's simple. In phase one, it's all about dealing with a few sophisticated people. And then phase two is dealing with lots of people with less money. We start in Australia. Henny alluded to it. The results were really, really interesting, but it was based very much on a traditional model had all the right compliances and everything else, and it was all sophisticated investors. But the numbers were, were really, really compelling. We went to, to America and did a similar thing. But the challenge that we had was the legalities. We could see the car, we could, we could, we could visualize the car, but no one could build us the car. The lawyers told us we weren't allowed to drive the car on the streets. And we got more and more frustrated. The more we learned, the more frustrated we got. And so two things changed. The first one is that exchange control in South Africa loosened up, so we didn't have to do complicated things like asset swaps and everything else. And the second thing is that a thing called crowdfunding came about. And really, it's a really, really interesting story, but for many, many years we were trying to solve the problem. And I told you a lesson I learned earlier today, but my philosophy has always just be go straight to the top. So if you're struggling, and our lawyers were literally telling us it's not possible. Now the laws changed in September last year, and in October we sat with our American lawyer, very esteemed, who's very, very qualified at sending you an invoice. And he told me it's not possible, and I said, well, and this is my direct question to him, did you ride in on a horse? And he looked at me, he was a bit confused. I said, did you ride in on a horse? And he said, no, why? I said, exactly, we're all now driving cars. So we decided to use a different strategy this year. We went straight to the source. Where is the greatest innovation on this planet? Where is the greatest innovation on this planet? Silicon Valley. It's exactly it. So in March, we did something different. We decided to go to Silicon Valley and find the best people that could build us a car and the lawyers that could get us qualified so that we had a driver's license and we could drive the car. And without further ado, I would like to welcome up, who really for me has become a good friend in a very short space of time. You know, I refer to him as the Mark Zuckerberg of crowdfunding. And with a very cheeky face like that, do you think he likes to abide by the 20th century laws? Can we have a huge round of applause for Joseph all the way from Silicon Valley, America? So funny when he circs, um, he told me um, when I got to Cape Town that I was going to be introduced as the Mark Zuckerberg of crowdfunding. I was like, <laughs> he's um, because I've um, stood in front of crowds numerous times talking about funding and funding things you believe in and um, things that you know. And Mark Zuckerberg is often the brunt of my jokes um, as it relates to, um, to that. Um, I ask folks, how many folks have um, clicked an ad on Facebook? Anybody click an ad on Facebook? And how many of you that clicked an ad on Facebook bought anything from that? And that's who I think should be investing in Facebook. The rest of us, I don't know the business model yet. All right, so let's talk about crowdfunding. About eight years ago, um, seven years ago, I was sitting with an attorney, um, great guy, and um, a whole bunch of other attorneys, not so great guys. And, um, and I was working with a client, and we were talking about, um, I don't remember what we were talking about, actually, because I wasn't really listening. 
Um, I was there as a consultant, and you know, consultants, we are just paid to tell stories. And I wasn't being asked to tell a story at the time, so I was just keeping my mouth shut. And I was um, playing on my cell phone and my smartphone, and I've always been an early adopter of stuff, and I think I had a, a you know, fancy big phone and, um, with a screen, and it had apps on it, and I was thinking I was really cool. And um, one of the clients turned to me and said, well, what do you think we should do, Joseph? No idea what we were even talking about. So I said, well, I'd like to have a Groupon app on my phone where I could search local investments and with one click invest in them directly out of my self-directed IRA, my retirement account. My attorney put his head in his hands. He said, you have no idea how illegal that is. I said, I know it's illegal now, but will it always be illegal? Is there a chance we could change this? Of course, the lawyer's answer was no. Fortunately, um, the answer is yes. And we've been able to pat ourselves on the back and start building an infrastructure to support the online solicitation, sale, and support of securities. And just like real estate is the backbone of economies um, that drive the jobs, that build the families to support our communities, the transformation that we're going to talk about, about uh, of private securities, not just in the US market, but worldwide, is absolutely destroying and blowing up. It's a complete disruption of how private capital is going to flow around the world. Okay, Let me try that slightly different way. We have three disruptive forces that have all come together and collided at the same time. And it is changing forever how private capital will be invested in businesses and how investors will be able to access ownership. It's a tsunami. And we have an opportunity to be swept by it or ride it. One of my greatest business mentors um, was nearing the end of his life, and um, we were um, doing uh, memorials for him and thanking him for everything he had done for us. And he took me aside and gave me what turned out to be his last words of wisdom for me. And he said, you know, Joseph, business is an awful lot like surfing. And we're in Minnesota. There's not really very big um, surf waves um, anywhere nearby. And he said, you bob in the water for a long time, and you hope you are up more than you're down on the average. And every once in a while, a big wave's going to come by. And it's your job to recognize it and jump on it. That's what we're talking about. The first big change is the transformative power of technology. So we talk about it in um, broad general senses, but any of us that know specific industries where technology has swept through, we've seen a complete transformation of at a core, the business models change, right? We have transparencies, we have efficiencies, we have productivity drivers that come into place. The technology creates the platform for things to be different. The second big change is the adoption of that technology by individuals. And that adoption, that wholesale adoption of the individual technology tools in finance and in the financial service space. So where it started with trickles of I was just trying to get a date online um, to now I was getting my information online to now I was willing to actually buy stuff online, now I was willing to do banking online, the leading edge of that change trickling around the world is that people are willing to do and move investing online with an E-Trade account or an Ameritrade account. And now there's a unique opportunity for that technology to hit the leading edge of adoption because of a, regular, of a big idea perpetuated by a regulatory change. And the big idea is crowdfunding. 
It's such a new, fancy, fantastic term. What does it mean? It means a whole group of people aggregate their economic power, throw it in a bucket, and support a project, a business, or a company that they believe in. Right? So we pool our economic resources to get something done. Sounds like a really innovative new idea, right? You know, I went to um, one of my clients, she's an IT professional. She ended up joining us as the CIO of the company. And I, um, she worked at CH Robinson Worldwide Logistics. And I said, um, you know, I'm gonna have to leave as a consultant. I'm doing this crowdfunding thing. And she asked me a little bit more about it. And she said, you know, when I grew up in China, the greatest possession, the greatest thing we could pass on to our granddaughter was the membership in the investment club, where the women got together, pooled their money, and funded one of the women's businesses. And you never went bad on that debt because you'd be ostracized from your community forever. Is that what you mean by crowdfunding? And I thought for a minute that I was going to say, no, it's about websites. And I said, that's exactly what I mean by crowdfunding. She wrote the first check for the company. You know, I went to my uncle and I said, oh, I'm not going to be able to pay back some of my family debts for a little while. Um, I'm hoping that you, know, you might be able to cover me. Um, and he's, I started explaining what I was doing. Um, he's actually on the board of Wikipedia, so I thought I'd had a good chance with this. And he looks at me and he goes, crowdfunding? You mean the synagogue? I'm like, no, no, I'm talking about websites. He goes, you mean the synagogue? I'm like, ah, yes. He goes, for thousands of years, we didn't have access to the traditional financial instruments. We got together, you pitched your project to the elders at the synagogue, they liked it, they funded it, they showed up to make sure it was successful so they'd get their money back. Is that what you mean? I was like, absolutely. <laughs> got that friends and family check as well. Right? So in every culture, you have it here as well, in every culture around the world, there's a long-standing tradition of where people pool their economic resources to build the infrastructure, to build the businesses, to build the businesses that, um, and buildings that they care about. We all sit in our um, religious communities and they pass the hat and we throw the money in and that's a good old-fashioned crowdfunding. And then we started institutionalizing it. Started in 1620 in the crown. They started saying, you're gonna pool that, we want a piece of it. And it started down a long road of institutionalization, of professionalization of who could do it, who couldn't, what they could say, when they could say it, who could invest, who couldn't invest. And then the big action happened which was in the largest private capital market in the world, in the United States, where 50% of private capital is, and where businesses from all over the world migrate specifically to access those private capital, a unique confluence of political forces happened that we could talk about for a long time. The US Congress is well known for being a highly efficient body, so they were able to very effect, just kidding, they're not at all. But they did pass one major bill in 2012, and it was the first deregulation of the securities market since it had been created, 80 years. The first deregulation. They passed the Jobs Act. Um, you know, it wasn't really about jobs because that's what it was called. So um, they passed the Jobs Act in April of 2012, it has four titles, and I can get into the nuances and specificity of it, but the first rule were um, to approve one of the specific sections happened in 2013 and went into manifestation of August, in September of last year. So we're talking extraordinarily new. It created a new classification of securities, and in fact, Wealth Migrate has on their website right now one of the very first of those type of securities available anywhere in the world. The first thing it did was it changed how you could talk about your security to who you could talk about it. And the first time I could hijack any of these social media platforms and start talking about my investment. I didn't have to go through the gatekeepers I didn't have to sign NDAs. I didn't have to have pre-existing um, relationships. I didn't have to be a registered authorized rep. They lifted the ban on general solicitation. 
so that I could stand up in front of a conference and tell you that I have a company that's raising $3 million on a 6.5% fixed note. It's a private security position, first position for the investors. Um, we're expecting a 16% IRR. And a year ago, I could be thrown in jail for saying that. And today, I can take out a billboard and solicit investors for that private investment. The second big thing it did is it changed who could invest. So previously, only accredited investors, or in some countries, it's the qualified investor. In some countries, it's the sophisticated investor. In the United States, it was the accredited investor. And in fact, if you were a non-US resident, you had to meet US resident qualifications in order to participate in those private securities. So it meant that you had to have a net worth of $2 million. So that's a relatively small percentage of the population, even in the United States. And they changed the rules to create classifications of securities so that everybody could participate in the private securities market. So what happens when you literally change the foundational rules for the selling of private securities, debt, equity, royalties, changing royalties, who can fund movies or Broadway shows, changing debt, who can participate in financing mortgages or working capital loans, changing equity, who could own a piece of the new tech startup companies. You change the entire market and you go from a few investors behind gatekeepers to an unlimited number of prospective investors. You go from very limited choices for the businesses and the investors to fundamentally unlimited number of choices for the businesses and investors. And you go from a highly inefficient, paper-centric, labor-intensive model for the solicitation and sale of securities and open up the opportunities to take fangled new things into account and do things like email in the private securities market. So really quickly, kind of as a recap really fast, before the law changed, and in places around the world, there were two kinds of crowdfunding allowed, donations and premium. And donations were like those donations at the church that you gave, all right? Premiums were on sites like Indiegogo and Kickstarter, I believe there's local ones here as well, where you had an expectation of like the pre-purchase of a product. We always joked it's the band model because some of the first Crowdfunders in the premium space were the bands, musical bands. They didn't have the money to go into the studio, so they went to their fans and said, pre-purchase my CD, and for 25 bucks, you can have the CD. For 50 bucks, you can come to our kickoff party. For 150 bucks, you can sleep with the drummer, right? So they get their little premium levels, they raise their money, they go into the studio, they have a fantastic um, kickoff party because everybody had pre-registered and was coming, presumably the drummer's happy, and now they were launched. Technically, donations and premium live 100% in the gift space. It's not a security by any international standard because there's no expectation of profit or financial return. And then they opened the door to the double bottom line underneath and said, now you can do debt and equity, securities. You can start using those beautiful online platforms that we call crowdfunding sites to actually solicit and sell securities. So at a core, very conscious of the time, we are having a complete flip of the business model for every company involved in the private security industry. The lawyers, the accountants, the brokers, the dealers, the marketing people, 
everybody, they used to live in a space of low volume, high touch, few clients that they spent a lot of time with, and they made a lot of money from each of them. High margin. But what happens when that technology comes through and the efficiencies grow, and now I can talk to everybody, it flips the business model to very low margins. More money in the hands of the businesses, more of the investor money directly in wealth production. Low touch, <coughs> meaning we're providing the tools for the investors to view and see and do their own due diligence. We're shutting off the gatekeepers that um, between the due diligence that is happening and the due diligence the investor can see. We create a low touch system. And to make up for that, we have to get to a high volume space. So instead of picking the 150 businesses that get private capital funding in Silicon Valley every year, now they're going to be looking to how they fund 15,000. And it completely changes the analysis and the networks of who gets to decide worldwide what businesses grow and what businesses don't grow. So my company is building back-end platforms, the sophisticated back engines that will be fully compliant. And this afternoon, we're going to show you the Wealth Migrate platform that we've built for them, where we can actually, on our cell phone today, log into the Wealth Migrate account, register, set up, qualify, set up a bank account in real time, um, a trading account in real time at a US bank through an LLC, and make a commitment to one of the Wealth Migrate products we've talked about all on your phone today. All right. But in no other market worldwide will crowdfunding be as transformative? Will the market forces unleashed by crowdfunding be more dramatic than in real estate? Because unlike that beautiful Facebook stock, when I buy a piece of a medical building, I own something real, and there's liquidity for it. And the options for that are unbelievable. So instead of you having to have enough money to buy one home as an investment, now all of us together in this room could pool a little bit of money and collectively own that home. And big office towers that were out of reach for mere mortals like you and I because they won't start talking to somebody without a $20 million line of credit, to even participate in the funding of the tower, now we can all pool our money and have a seat at that table. I ran businesses. I've operated businesses. I've funded and invested businesses. And I'm one of the leading voices around crowdfunding. I'll tell you a secret. Crowds scare me. There's a really fine line between a crowd and a mob. And I'm not a huge believer in the concept that many of the evangelists of crowdfunding talk about of the emerging crowd wisdom. It might be because I had a previous career in politics and I saw that the majority rarely picked the right person. Um, but we had, to, because we come out of, and our company came out of we shared a core value that there, could, that there was a way to do this that protected investors and protected the business. And we focused rather than on crowds made up of gross numbers where we're just peeling off small percentages to how we build communities. The name of our company is Community Leader. We focus on how you build communities. And that's why we form partnerships with groups of experts like Wealth Migrate that's focusing on how do they know that community in Atlanta? How do they know that community of medical building investments? 
And how do they build a relationship among and between you to make that investment work over the long term? Not to get in and out, but to make that investment work over the long run. And that is an essential component that we could talk a lot about, is how community-based approach to crowdfunding directly addresses many of the extraordinarily legitimate concerns raised by both investors and operators alike about this brand new marketplace. So we're building sites in multiple markets, multiple industries all around the world. And the one that we're most excited about is the Wealth Migrate site because they've brought together all of the critical pieces to make crowdfunding work. A commitment to a technology, a commitment to quality products, a commitment to a business model where they have a vested interest in the long-term success so that the investors can build out a balanced portfolio within this new emerging asset class. We're also excited about Wealth Migrate because uniquely they have the ability to bring worldwide real estate assets directly here on your phone. Fundamentally, the Wealth Migrate platform and these crowdfunding platforms that are built with the same integrity and will have associated relationships with the Wealth Migrate platforms are the surfboards to ride that wave and put a whole new world of investment opportunities directly in your hands. And that's the power, the transformative power of crowdfunding for real estate. Just, just very quickly here, um, we're live, ladies and gentlemen. We're not talking about th uh, theory or, or anything. You can go to wealthmigrate.com. As, uh, as uh, Joseph alluded to, the exciting thing here is that imagine having all your investments in one place. South Africa, Australia, England, doesn't matter where it is, all, everything in one place. It's only got four steps to it. It's that simple. You literally go on, you have your email verified, you select an investment, you can transact online. Five years ago, a lawyer, one of the most esteemed lawyers in South Africa, I asked him, I said, how long do you think it'll be until I can buy a property without signing that million thousand forms that I hate? He said, it's never going to happen. Well, there it is. You don't need one piece of pen or a piece of paper. And what is absolutely fantastic is that you can manage your entire portfolio of a dashboard. The vision, and it's not there yet, will be that off your, off your phone or your iPad, you'll literally have... 100 Rand doesn't make any difference. And you could say, right, I want to put 30 Rand into Australia, 20 Rand, you can literally just slide it around with your finger. You'll be able to watch all your portfolios. Imagine if you could say to yourself, using some of the technology of Dolph, it's like, I want to retire, take what RJ said, I want to retire in 10 years. And you could slide it around based on all the different assumptions and all the different technologies that we've got. And suddenly your year to retirement changes from 7.2 years to 13 years because you maybe didn't take grand devaluation into account. How cool would that be in terms of where this is all going? I mean, if you look here and you go up, as you spoke about, just some of the investments that literally you can go in. You, you've seen the gentleman, Dolph and Henny, going through it. The, the level of due diligence is at a level that, that most people just have no idea about. And yet, it'll always be improved upon as well. And that's what Joseph said is that no matter who we partner with, it'll almost be like a McDonald's model where we will not partner with people unless they abide by the principles upon which we work. The most important one being that our interests are aligned, backed up by trust and transparency. You can go in there now and 20,000 Rand, you can invest with Arjo. In the future, imagine being able to buy medical buildings anywhere in the world off your dashboard, off your phone. But in the old days, this is how it used to work. Joe Soap wanted to invest in real estate. But to do that, he had to go and speak to a financial advisor or a broker who charged 1.1 to 2%. That then went to a pension fund. Now, 
As a pension fund, they would take anywhere from 1% to 2%. Then it would be a private equity fund that they would invest with. They are generally take about 2% and a 20% performance fee. And then they deal with real estate brokers, both buying and selling, for 1% to 3%. They've forgotten the guys that organize the finance and the acquisition fees and all of the fees of the process. Now, what is the name for all those fees? Robbery? Well, if you're, from Econo if you're from Silicon Valley, you've got to have a much more sophisticated term. It's called economic leakage. <laughs> Joseph's term, I'll give him credit for that. And interestingly enough, we had, a, we had someone challenge us in terms of uh, the performance fees, because you'll see 2 and 20s are very commonly in the term here. And um, now as a fund, is it in their interests whether the properties perform or not, yes or no? Not really. If I get 10 million or 100 million, the most important thing to me is how much I've got under management. Whether it's going up or down, it's not as important to me. If I'm in syndication, my most important thing is how much money can I raise up front because that's how I make my money. In terms of these fees, you talk about transparency. We looked into one of the most decorated companies in this country who was investing in Australia, and they had a 2 in 20 model. But actually, when we looked at it, they were earning 15.5% in fees before the investor made one cent. You just don't know what the 0.5s and the 0.25s and the 1% and the 3% and all that add up to. Can, um, you, can you go back a second? I want to just point out something really quick. From a real estate perspective, as with all of the other businesses in this space, that means that when you're looking at all of those economic variables, the economic analysis of whether the property at the end makes sense has to take that all into account. So instead of this number of properties making sense for investment, now it's this number. You strip all those fees out of the process and connect the investment directly with the investor, and now the number of viable investments goes way up, which means that there's a delta there of investment opportunities, good investment opportunities, that the traditional players aren't going to be looking at. It's amazing he says that because the, the gap that uh, we found in the States, as an example, is between $1 and $10 million. Above $1 million, the mom and pops, the doctors and the dentists can't afford to invest. And below $10 million in capital, the hedge funds don't want to play because it's too much effort to get involved. Fantastic. We've got no one to fight with. It's exactly what you're saying in terms of where you are. And really where it allows you to play now is that Jill Soap wants to invest in property through the use of the internet there are no fees, purely performance fees that are earned after the target return has been achieved. Trust, transparency, and interests being aligned. Now, you've got to admit, this is pretty exciting in terms of where the world's going. Yes or no? Yes. What is the challenge that we've got? And I'd like Joseph just to finish off with this. The challenge we've got is that I'm almost sure in the next day or two, I'll be getting a nice little email from my good friends in the compliance department, because how do you take 21st century technology and match it with 20th century laws that were created by industries to protect financial advisors in jobs where they add no value? So what I found fascinating is that when you work with the best in the world and you work with the best in Silicon Valley, our, li our website went live last Tuesday. We applied to the SEC on Tuesday morning, and if you can read this email, it says, the following submission has been accepted by the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Now, quite what I find very interesting is that America is 22% of the world's GDP with 29% of the world's wealth, with 4.4% of the world's population. South Africa is 0.07% of the world's GDP with 0.05% of the world's wealth, with some inconsequential number of the world's population. The SEC is around the world, and I'd love you just, Joseph, to finish off with this and explain it, is recognized as the number one compliance and regulatory environment in the world. You can legally actually choose to rather have your money protected by the SEC than by the FSB, or anyone else for that matter. And if you wouldn't mind just explaining that and unearthing that a bit, because this is where the barriers to entry and the compliance is going to fall down all over the world. Because if you've already got approval from the best in the world, my question is why wouldn't some of the subsidiary organizations look at what is in the best interest 
of people that they're trying to serve. So I'm going to answer this, um, kind of illuminate on this point in two ways. The first is to um, tell you a story. I, I wrote a, um, a report, co-wrote a report for the Inter-American Development Bank, which is uh, um, an international bank um, covering both North and South America. It was founded when NAFTA, which was a free trade agreement between all the countries, all the countries pooled some money to drive economic development for those that might get left behind by the new trade laws. So I wrote a report for them, um, which you can get online, about um, how crowdfunding could be used to drive economic development in the underdeveloped world with an emphasis initially on Mexico. One of the things that the Mexican government pointed out and we discovered was because of how the securities laws were structured, a Mexican business that wanted to raise money would talk to their Mexican investors. And the Mexican investor would look at it and say, <laughs> um, I need my um, self covered and protected, so I need you to offer this security in the United States. So the Mexican government or Mexican company would walk over to a securities um, team in the United States and actually list the security in the US market. And the US market, being an attractor of private capital, has an entire structure set up for that called the foreign entity exemption. You don't even have to be a US-based company or a US-based asset to sell, elicit and sell securities within the US structure. So a Mexican company would file that exemption, and then guess where they'd go for their investors? Back to Mexico, and get all the investments there. But both of them felt protected by a new economic exchange market. Well, they could do that because it was close. It physically was close to make that all work. Now, with the internet, we can aggregate all of those countries together. So Wealth Migrate can find the best securities laws for soliciting their investments that are responsive to them as an issuer and protect their investors. So what we're going to see in the next eight to you know, five years is the first emergence of international security standards. And it's going to be all constructed around the foundational principle of the democratization of financial capital that all of us should have an opportunity to invest in the businesses that we care about, and all of us should have the same access to the wealth generation engines. I mean, just on a finishing note with what he's saying, we sat all weekend, the whole team, the whole investment team with Joseph and, and agreed the future. And um, I think it's amazing and remarkable that uh, he was prepared to come out to South Africa, which, uh, you know, round of applause to you, dude, because I really, really, uh, for me, it's amazing. Like, but, um, I mean, guys, I didn't, I didn't expect you guys to be able to share this personally. We all got to share it and experience in America. But um, in the next six months, we'll be rolling out South Africa, the UK, Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Brazil, the Netherlands by the end of November. We're missing one out of the six continents. And one of uh, Dolphin Mai's tasks has to be to go and find an igloo in Antarctica. <laughs> But seriously, by the end of this year, you on your phone will have access globally, both inward and externally, in terms of where this is going. And the really, really exciting thing, and it's not quite there yet, but imagine the bridge where people in the emerging world can invest in the first world in good quality assets, not rubbish, and get passports. Or people in the first world can invest in the emerging world where they're far better returns and eliminate the currency. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the future. That's where we're going. This man's an expert on, uh, on EB-5s and uh, passports and residency. And uh, in the very near future, one of our targets is that you can invest in Sydney, London, or America in good quality assets and businesses and be able to get passports where you're not buying a boat you know, hoping to get a passport, but you know you're getting a bad investment in the process.